reports. And with that said, um, so really, really thank you for joining us. Uh, interesting debate. Hydrogen is on top of the agenda, especially in UK. Uh, I expect that you have people from elsewhere. Uh, but uh, yeah, at some point in the future, uh, your countries or your cities will be debating hydrogen as well. The pros, cons, challenges, and opportunities. So uh, before we start, it's a pleasure for us in SP London YP uh, uh, to receive uh, Tom Baxter, uh, who is a chemical engineering consultant currently. Uh, but Tom graduated in Strike Cloud University in 1975. Uh, so not too long time ago, uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering, first class honors. He's a fellow of the Institute of Chemical Engineers, and he started his career with ICI Petrochemicals and moved to Fine Chemicals with the Swiss company Cybergeji before taking a position as a process engineer in 1980 with the British National Oil Corporation. Uh, through the privatization and acquisitions, uh, BNOC, as it was called, uh, became Brit Oil uh, and then uh, BP, British Petroleum, and then Beyond Petroleum, now uh, only on the BP, as we know. Here he worked uh, as a, there is, he worked as an operation engineer, development engineer, and research, research manager. He's currently a chemical engineering consultant, providing energy and greenhouse gas reduction expertise uh, for or industry. Uh, he's currently based in Glasgow, and uh, I will hand over to, to, to him, and it's a really pleasure to have you here, Tom. Uh, the floor is yours. And just say that we we'll take uh, most of the questions at the end, but please pop them in the chat as we go along, and at the end, we will have 10 uh, or so minutes uh, to try to answer there. Tom, the floor is yours. Okay. Um... Nathan, th thanks very much, and I'm, I'm really pleased you you guys asked me to, to give this presentation. It's one that I've given to all companies, to finance companies, to um, professional bodies. So um, let's see how you guys um, feel about what I'm saying. So the first few slides are, are about context, and uh, the context is the UK. I, I will drift off the UK into um, the wider um, aspects across Europe and the world. But here in the UK, what I've got here is the um, CO2 equivalent emissions from the main sectors. And um, here we can see in the y-axis, millions of, millions of tonnes per year uh, with transport and energy supply, so energy generation, business, our houses, agriculture, et cetera, through. So the, 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 there's some um, key areas that we, we should have a look at when we're looking at where hydrogen might fit with um, reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. And one thing I want you to think about is residential emissions are here, but energy supply, a lot of that is to supply energy to our houses and transport is dominated by passenger cars which again is us in our houses. So um, us as consumers, as, um, as taxpayers in the UK have a, a huge contribution to the, this um, total of 450 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent per annum. Now, the next slide talks about where my thinking comes from. And as the presentation evolves, um, it evolves from um, what you're seeing here. And the Euro European Commission produced, um, it's about two years ago, an integrated energy strategy. And the three main aspects of the, the, the strategy were energy efficiency at the core, use less energy. So we're talking about energy efficiency. A greater direct electrification of the end users, and where electrification isn't viable or isn't economic, think about um, low carbon fuels such as hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives, maybe biofuels, um, et cetera. And my thinking is also influenced by the climate science is saying action is needed now. It's not needed 
in, in two decades' time. This decade and the next decade uh, are where we have to make very significant greenhouse gas reductions if we have, if we do have to um, or do deliver on um, a 1.5 degree um, climate increase. So first of all, let's have a look at hydrogen. And uh, you've all seen this, it's the most common element in the universe. It's produced from electricity uh, and water, it can be stored. And you, you, you all know what, what, what's, what's coming here. You see it everywhere in the, uh, in the media and the scientific media as well. And hydrogen ticks the boxes for investors, for investors thinking about environmental social governments. Governance, there's a bit of what's not to like about hydrogen. It's got all these great features. But, and I'll, I'll finish the, um, the talk with, I'll put a but after each one of these. And, and it's not nearly as straightforward as this superficial um, hit list would suggest. So firstly, um, ju just some properties of hydrogen. Um, it, it, it's, it's lauded having a, a, a great, uh, a very high mass energy density, 100 uh, megajoules per kilogram. It's, it's lower calorific heating value um, compared to methane. Methane is only 50. But of course, we transport energy generally by volume, not by mass. And when you look at the volumetric, um, heating value or calorific value. Uh, hydrogen is, is less than a third of methane. When we move to um, liquids, um, kerosene has about seven times the, the volumetric um, calorific value of liquid hydrogen. And that's obviously important for things like av aviation. Yeah. We see lots about blending. Up to 20% uh, hydrogen can be put in the natural gas um, network, and we don't have to change our boilers. But 20% by volume natural gas is only a 7% reduction in CO2. And because of hydrogen's very low molecular weight, it takes a lot of power to move a kilowatt hour. In fact, it takes three and a half times more uh, to move than it would to move methane. So already the, the hydrogen story is not quite as rosy as the, um, as the initial what's not to like aspects um, suggested. Now at the moment, um, hydrogen is generally loose um, in the sectors we can see here. Chemicals, 65%, refining, uh, less so in the uh, iron and steel and other industries. And hydrogen is derived mostly from natural gas, um, oil and coal. And only a very small amount at the moment is um, through electrolysis. Now, the, the, the main process for producing hydrogen from fossil fuels is, is reforming, basically steam methane, methane reforming. And um, hydrogen at the moment is responsible for around 830 million tonnes a year of CO2. So hydrogen production at the moment is a CO2 problem. And my thinking is one of the first things we should tackle is current hydrogen production. Gray, brown, black hydrogen uh, is, a, 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 is a serious contributor in its own right. And it's actually the same size as the global aviation um, CO2 um, uh, carbon footprint. And it's even bigger if you account for methane losses, methane fugitives um, in the, um, the supply chain. So I, I, my thinking is, um, well, if we're going, to, going after hydrogen, let's first sort out dirty, grey, blue and brown hydrogen. So th th these numbers are a bit dated with the current uh, energy spikes. But um, last year in the UK, uh, natural gas prices were around 3.8 pence per kilowatt hour. You can more than double that at the moment. Uh, and same with electricity. But the, 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 the ratio stays about the same. 
And it's no surprise that in the, uh, the UK, most houses are heated not by electricity at that price, but with natural gas at that price. So it, it just stands to reason that around 80 odd percent of our domestic houses are heated by natural gas. Now, what we need to do is obviously decarbonize hydrogen if we're going to use it. And there's basically two options, as you guys know. One is blue hydrogen, which is steam methane reforming or using um, um, the, the uh, thermal oxidation. Um, and the cost of hydrogen pounds per kilogram, and this is according to the Scottish government, uh, is around this area here. So uh, 1.6, 1.8 pounds per kilogram. At the moment, green hydrogen, which is made from the uh, electrolyzing water with renewable electricity, so electricity with virtually no carbon footprint, the cost is up here, but it's projected to come down. So 2020, moving to 2050, uh, there's a big range. Uh, that big range is one as a function of um, of electricity prices. But what the Scottish government are saying that the earliest parity is around 2034. And if we take the average, it might be um, 2050. And at this point, where we want to be is net zero. So if, if we follow this logic, blue hydrogen is going to take a, a significant place in producing um, low carbon hydrogen. So um, let's develop that. And incidentally, I'll give you a copy of all these slides. And where I've used information, there's a hyperlink at the bottom that um, uh, you, you could use to uh, see where I've got the uh, figures that I'm talking about. So let's look at um, uh, how we might go forward then. Recognizing that domestic heating is one of the biggest CO2 contributors. Uh, as we stand at the moment. So I'll, I'll go to the bottom first. So at the moment, we have natural gas. Uh, we'll have some losses here. We'll have some losses in the gas boiler. And that's about 80% efficient or for a, a kilowatt hour here to, to a kilowatt hour into the house. If we introduce um, blue hydrogen, so we've now got natural gas, which we're going to reform, and we're going to capture the carbon and then store it in, in a geological trap somewhere. We're going to treat that, we're going to compress it, we're going to take it to the house. And that, that step there introduces inefficiencies. So the, the overall efficiency now is around 50 to 60%. So if I'm going this route, I need more natural gas than I, than I do at the moment. So I'm going to have to import more nat natural gas, which means I have more import or supply chain emissions, predominantly methane. So I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to get concerned about um, blue hydrogen. Now, um, this is re really, um, really complicated, but what, what, what I want to just draw out from this is um, this kind of purple color um, is, is um, the percentage or the fraction of the UK um, energy uses, and this is natural gas, yeah, and um, this is petroleum. Uh, we've got a kind of renewables down here. We'll get a, a sliver of coal. Um, so our big targets for reducing CO two are petroleum and natural gas. But if we deploy blue hydrogen. We need to import, and I've ringed it here, natural gas into the UK. At the moment, um, that's 44.5 um, million barrels of oil equivalent. Uh, our indigenous generation is 39. So we import more gas, and we're going to have to import more gas. And does that feel right when we're in this energy crisis, um, the, 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 the Ukraine effects, the... Um, Russian gas, 
does it feel right that we're going to deploy blue hydrogen, which means we have to import more gas or generate more gas um, in our, uh, 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 indigenously with the associated methane emissions? I, I, I've done a, a calculation, um, and you don't see this um, in many places. What you do see in the, in the literature, in the media, is the wholesale cost of hydrogen, what it's going to cost to produce, not what it's going to cost for you and I as a consumer in the house. And my calculations say that based on last year's four pence a kilowatt hour for natural gas, we're going to double that. And that will push many more families into fuel poverty if we use blue hydrogen as um, a, 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 um, a, a vector, an energy vector for heating in our houses. So much so that the German government, they have disavowed blue hydrogen. They, 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 will, they are not putting any grant money, any, uh, any government money now into blue hydrogen. And, and that's a position I have got myself to as well. I, I think blue hydrogen is a bad idea um, for, for the previous reasons I've outlined. It's energy inefficient and the associated um, uh, methane emissions are really a question whether blue hydrogen has got a role. So we'll move on now to green hydrogen. So here we've got um, renewable electricity. And I've taken 100 watts. So we put that through an electrolyzer. Uh, that's about 75% efficient. And we'll get 75 watts of hydrogen. And then we'll um, compress and store and treat that. So we get 67 going to the house. The house burners are about 90% efficient. So we get about 60 watts appearing for that 100 watts of electricity. Now, if we take that 100 watts of electricity straight to the house and we take it to a heat pump with a coefficient of performance of around three, I can get 270 watts into the house. So I've now got um, something like three to four times more efficient at the heating process as I do with if I use green hydrogen for heating. And, and I look at this as well, and I think, well, I've got electricity, and I put all this new stuff here, and I'm going to buy the electricity. I've got green electricity here, and I take it straight to the house, and I'm going to buy that electricity. And I think, how can X be less than Y? If I've got, if I'm reducing the, 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 the efficiency, I need to import more electricity. I, I can't see how green hydrogen is going to be cheaper than the electricity it was derived from. Now, there's other aspects, particularly the capital costs here, um, the capital costs of the electrolyzers. Um, the treatment and storage, the network upgrades for the gas. And of course, we, we, yeah, we need electricity grid upgrades and the cost of putting a heat pump um, in, in, into the, um, the, the house. All that has to be taken together um, to, to establish um, which would be the preferred route. But what's obvious to me is if we go this route compared to that route, we're going to need four to five times more re renewable stations to deliver a kilowatt this way than a kilowatt that way. Now, hydrogen is good for big business. And uh, one of the phrases I use is, what is good for big business is not necessarily good for the consumer. So hydrogen is good for big business because you can sell more turbines and panels. Uh, you can use existing gas infrastructure. You can sell more electricity because it's inefficient. Um, um, hydrogen will be derived from fossils for the next decade or more. So as a fossil company, I like it. I, I, and, and there's a lot of big business benefits to hydrogen. Um, the gas boiler manufacturers like it because they can sell more gas boilers. 
and, and uh, the people that are selling um, reformers will like it because blue hydrogen will um, be good for their business. Now, what I see as well is, is hydrogen being hyped. The information provided um, needs scrutiny and it needs um, uh, verification. It needs understanding. And there's the, the all part, parties parliamentary group on hydrogen, which lobbies government. Now, look at who is sponsoring this APPG. And you can see fossil companies, boiler manufacturers, gas grid operators, all organizations that will benefit from hydrogen. And if you look at one of the reports, um, uh, that it says that the green are, are um, a hydrogen and blue hydrogen will benefit the customer by 89 billion. Yeah, big number. I thought I'll track that number down. And what I found was that the number is 1390 billion minus 1301 billion. So that's 89 billion and 1,400 billion, that's only 6%. That's an accuracy of 6%. You can't cost forecast that to 2050 to plus or minus 60%. That is a cost forecasting nonsense. If I change some of the assumptions here, that will flip. I, I, and it's presenting to the consumer, to the reader, a distorted view, an unbalanced view, of the benefits of um, hydrogen. Here's another one, the Energy Ut Utilities Alliance, uh, which are a big promoters of gas, yeah. And here they're looking at deploying heat pumps. And they produced a report that said, um, you know, it was a RAG assessment, red, amber, green, that heat pumps are not suitable for any mid-terrace house. That's nonsense. There's lots of heat pumps in mid-terrace houses. And, and again, uh, people read this, and it's, it's biased, unbalanced um, information that they're getting from organizations who will benefit from, uh, from hydrogen. So that's heat. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly move on now to, um, to um, transport. Now, here's the transport emissions for the UK dominated by passenger cars. Next up is heavy goods vehicles and vans. And we often hear a lot about bus and rail. Look, look where bus and rail sits. It's, it, it's, it's almost noise, as it is domestic shipping compared to passenger cars. So, so the, the, the debate is um, the hydrogen fuel cell electric passenger car or the battery passenger car. So I, I did an assessment uh, of this, um, appeared in a number of journals. And if you take 100 watts of renewable electricity and we convert it to hydrogen, then we compress and transport that hydrogen, then we take that to a fuel cell in the car. So we've got two vector um, changes. We've got electricity to hydrogen, and then we've got hydrogen back to electricity. It ends up we have only 38 watts approximately of the original energy appears as power on the drive shaft. Whereas if we go through the battery electric vehicle, which is electricity to electricity to electricity to electricity, around 80 watts will appear. So the battery electric vehicle is double the efficiency of the, um, the hydrogen fuel cell. And, and, I, and I'm with Ellen Musk here. I just don't see a case for hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. And I'm beginning to see more and more people aligning with this and government policies saying that electrification of passenger cars is the, um, is, is the primary way to get um, CO2 footprint down in transport. Now, batteries will only get better, in my opinion. Um, I've stolen this from Bloomberg, and we can see the, the range of the batteries um, increasing. I, I've just bought an electric car with a range around um, 350 kilometers. 
Yeah. And, and the energy density of a battery is steadily increasing. So that means smaller and smaller batteries, less weight in the battery to deliver um, kilowatts to the, to the vehicle. Now, Scania, which is Europe's biggest truck manufacturer, have realized this. And Scania uh, have now more or less dropped their hydrogen fuel cell um, large truck drive to, to um, electric. And I think more and more are going to go that way. And, and whilst lots say heavy haulage is a, is, a, is a route for hydrogen, I'm not convinced at all that that's an appropriate place uh, in the future for hydrogen. Here's some more um, hype that I saw. Um, this is um, a, 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 a graphic uh, saying that the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle has only 2.7 grams per kilometre of CO2 emissions, whereas the battery electric vehicles get 20.9. I thought that, that that doesn't pass my sniff test. I have to have a look at this. So I went and looked at it, and the assumption was the battery electric vehicle is if the electricity comes from burning fossil fuels, whereas the fuel cell electric vehicle comes from green electricity on an electrolysis. It's a completely distorted um, hype for promoting hydrogen. It, 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 but the public are going to see this and um, not understand what's behind the assumptions in this um, eye-catching graphic. I hear hydrogen for the, 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 a real revolution. I'm going to jump back. Um, I've gone too far. There's rail. It's tiny. And, um, you know, that we, we get even the government saying, um, will revolutionize rail hydrogen. Um, the press are talking about revolutionized hydrogen. Of course, this is British Auction Company, uh, which produce um, hydrogen plants. They're going to promote it. And if you actually go to the, the um, network rails of forward strategy, um, they think hydrogen may have a small role uh, but really, it's all about electrification of um, of the of the network. Again, um, a paper written uh, for a, a, a very reputable journal uh, from these um, guys from uh, Imperial College uh, next to university, um, and this is what they're saying: incumbents are overselling green gas to policymakers in order to protect their interests and detract from the importance and value of electrification. Electrification is a threat to many um, organizations and big businesses. Now, of course, you can't talk about batteries without uh, uh, raising environmental concerns. So here's the salt pans in um, Patagonia, um, using water, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, wh wh where we are is, the, the, the industry is really looking to uh, recycle um, most of the lithium and the materials that are in batteries. So we're now designing batteries with the end uh, of life recycling in mind. But what I would say is nothing is perfect. You know, we, we, we struggle with disposing of spent wind turbine blades, spent um, solar panels, but w w which have got lots of... Um, has this uh, material in them. And even fuel cells, which we're, go we're going to use, are proposed to use in many hydrogen applications, they use lots of platinum. Now, if you look at platinum, uh, platinum means of serious health risks for workers and host communi communities. Nothing is perfect. What we have to pick is, is the better sustainable option. Yeah, nothing is perfect. The, 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 there's no panacea out there. The hydrogen is often uh, proposed for uh, dispatchable energy for storage. Yeah. And it, it, there does seem to be a compelling case for hydrogen for storage. But there are other options for storage. I could 
still burn gas and accept short-term emissions. I could burn gas with carbon capture. I could use bioenergy with carbon Car car carbon capture. I could store energy thermally. I could store it with batteries, with hi hydro. I could use nu nuclear from a base load. I could uh, import from the continent. I could use biofuels, e-fuels, compressed gases, tidal, et cetera, et cetera. So th there seems to be a given that hydrogen is the way to go for long-term um, and intermittent storage. I'm not convinced at all. I want to see the evidence. And if um, we look at the left-hand plate here for the UK, 2015 to 2018, and here we see the usage in gigawatt hours per day. The top um, line is, um, is the total gigawatt hours per day. Blue is gas. Uh, electrical usage, uh, so the transport tends to stay constant and electrical usage varies somewhat uh, between the, um, the seasons. But the big variation is in gas. Now, what I've done on the right-hand side here, and watch the scale has changed. I said, let's imagine electrified future. So I've now got a heat pump, which is three times more efficient than gas. So my gas profile reduces. I use electrification, batteries in uh, transportation. So my transportation reduces, yeah. And, um, uh, well, electrification more or less stays the same. And I'm, I'm now using um, a, uh, renewables for that. Looking at the seasonal swing, uh, as we stand, it's around 3,000 gigawatt hours per day from summer to winter. If we electrify, that reduces by a third to around 900. So if we electrify, we need less storage and less dispatchable energy. What's coming at you guys? I often hear about uh, hard to beat industries, um, particularly steel and cement. Uh, globally, 9% of GHD is still big target. 97% for cement globally. If you look at the UK, the numbers are 2.2 and 1.5. They are not such big ticket items as they are in a global sense. What about industrial heating? Well, I recently wrote a paper, and you get a link here about the future of industrial heating. And I do see a role for hydrogen in high temperature heating. But here, I think electrification is a, is a better option. Now, Aviation, uh, big target. Is it a big target? So this is from the UK government's emissions from, for transport. And you can see passenger cars are the, are the biggest one. But let me ring hydrogen, sorry, civil aviation. Yeah. And shipping. They're pretty small targets. So... What I've done here is, um, here's emissions from aviation and millions of tons per year. This is globally. Um, so here we are globally. What I've overlaid there is the 850 million tons of CO2 from hydrogen production. So producing hydrogen today has got a big, as big a global or carbon footprint as aviation. And shouldn't we be tackling current hydrogen production before aviation, because aviation is decades away before we can, um, we can realize um, savings there. And similar for shipping, a, a, a different source here, but here's uh, shipping uh, millions of tons, there's hydrogen production and there's shipping um, less so. Where I do see a role for um, hydrogen is um, is in um, uh, maybe as an e-fuel. So we, we take renewable energy, we electrolyze it, and we couple hydrogen with CO2. And in this instance, we're making methanol. And uh, that's going towards shipping. And indeed, Maersk has, um, the, 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 they're developing some, um, some carriers 
with um, uh, using uh, green methanol. We can also use biofuels. And e-fuels and biofuels have a very big advantage over hydrogen direct in that they're dropping. We can use the same engine, let's say aviation or shipping, if we produce a, 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 a liquid biofuel with um, combustion characteristics similar to the, the engines that are used in shipping and in aviation. A few more slides, guys, and then I'll, I'll draw it to a close. Uh, I was very, very disappointed with the UK hydrogen strategy. Many people said it brought certainty. When I read it, it had 44 mays and 114 coulds with respect to hydrogen. And I just don't understand how people are saying it's bringing certainty. What they were talking about was five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen. That recently has gone up to 10, but I put five gigawatts on the energy consumption Today, this is a two, 2020 energy consumption in the UK, natural gas, you can see all the sources, um, other fuels, so that, that, that's um, petroleum. That is five gigawatts. It, 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 and, that, and that's in 2030. It really is, um, it's, it, it, it's not a significant feature at all for our future. And remember the way I started this, we need to do things this decade and this is, the next decade that are material if we have to, um, if we have any hope of reaching the uh, 1.5 degree warming target. And here's uh, the um, IEA's view on hydrogen. And th th they're very supportive of hydrogen. But yet in 2050, yeah, hydrogen is 6% of the, the fuel, uh, the, the way we're going to get after. Um, CO2 equivalent reductions. And people talk about hydrogen economy, 6%. I don't really get it. I don't get it. And I'm going to blow my own trumpet here. Here's the European Union I picked up on a lot of my papers um, saying that why people like hydrogen, fossil companies like it because it can derive from fossils. Gas grid and gas boiler manufacturers like it. Power utility companies like it because they're able to sell more power thanks to hydrogen inefficiencies. Uh, so I was really pleased to see someone calling this a few sobering quotes. But what I don't see in the UK is an integrated energy model. Some, a model that, that gets power generation, transport, heat and storage with a smart energy management system at the middle, taking recognition of energy efficiency, of lifestyle, are we going to put on a sweater and, and turn our thermostat down by one? Are we going to walk more? Are we going to eat less meat? And of course, we need the planning and the skills mix and the funding. I don't see an integrated model. What I see is transport being looked at in isolation. You look at transport in isolation and you look at hydrogen in isolation, you can present a compelling case. Similarly for heat and looking at sectors in isolation is not going to give the proper holistic view of what a vector like hydrogen or electrification or biofuels can do for our aspirations to deliver on net zero. So um, last but one, what I've said that I think we're analyzing energy options in silos and that's leading to unbalanced conclusions. Uh, what is good for big business is not necessarily good for you and I as a consumer. I think the immediate focus should be on what I've called big ticket items, and that's passenger cars and vans, domestic heating, insulation, energy efficiency, upgrading the grids, using smart grids, and renewable generation. My view is now is not hydrogen, and the case in many applications, as I see it for hydrogen, is evidence weak. So I won't go through all these, but I started with what's not to like about hydrogen, and I said there was a lot of buts. So here's the buts, and you can have a look at these uh, when I produce the, um, when I give you the slides. So thank you for attention. What I'm going to do now is um, hand you back to the chair, and then hopefully we can um, we can have a discussion, and I'll try my best to answer any questions that you may have.
yeah definitely don't think so much it's i think it's um yeah it, it, it's really insightful to have some different views as we have been used in the last two years or three since uh, hydrogen came to the main mainstreams and uh, 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 kind of usually with good news and kind of hitting the butts. And um, as a society of petroleum engineers, but talking about energy, I think we need to be really uh, challenging in terms of challenging information. We are, most of you probably are engineers, geologists. We need to challenge things and really ask, does this make sense? And really tell the public, uh, so uh, our families, et cetera, that, uh, well, you need to, to read what, what is in the footnotes always. So that was really, really good. Thanks so much. Um, we have one, one question uh, um, in the chat. And um, you may see, uh, um, guys, um, who are attending that uh, you can uh, do your, 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 the question by yourself. So I'll just ask you to go on the reactions and put your hand up and I will be calling you to do that. But for now we have one action, or oh, one question, sorry, um, from Vasilis Belegratis. Um, uh, the question is, how much would it cost uh, for the five gigawatt and what do, would be the CO2 saving as well? I think you showed in one slide that the tiny percentage by 2030 that this five gigawatt plan would be. So do you have any the cost for that? Well, I, I don't uh, off the top of my head. Um, it should be in the, the UK um, hydrogen strategy. So I'm, I'm going to disappoint Vasilis here and that um, I, I don't have the numbers to the top of my head. I'm sorry. Okay, no, no problem. Um, any, any one more questions? Um, if not, I have I have one. Um, it's kind of uh, it is, it's really insightful to me, um, and uh, to talk about the really really not just the, the the good things and 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 see the the, the both parts of the the, the same uh, uh, coin. Um, you you talked a lot about electrification. And especially, uh, and I kind of agree on that, it's, it's, it's really good for countries like UK where you have roads, you have how to do that is, is, is really not a big country like, for example, Brazil, India, China, where it's more difficult to do. Uh, but uh, in terms of, we know that you have uh, uh, kind of variations in terms of how much, uh, uh, Renewables can can pump to, to, to the grid in terms of electrification. There are times where they don't operate like sun overnight. And sometimes you don't have wind as we had in 2021, I think in February, March. Um, what would be your suggestion to back up that? Would, would that be gas with CCUS taking account? That that would be the main thing? Well, I think I I, I mentioned it here. Um, So we've got options. So what we, what we need is dispatchable energy. When the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, what are our, what are our options? And there's a list here of our options, of which um, e-fuels and hydrogen is one. My concern, Nathan, is that people are assuming that the only answer is hydrogen. And as, in, as an engineer, I want to see the evidence. I want to see the modeling that shows me that that's the correct answer. And I'm not seeing that modeling. What I'm seeing is an assertion. And I, I, I deal in numbers, yeah? Uh, although I may not be exact in the numbers, I'll, I'll, I'll look at risk spreads, much as we would do in a P10, P50, P90 case for a, a subsurface reservoir outcome. We need to be looking at the, the probabilities of outcomes for our energy security. And to do that, we need an integrated model. We need a risk model, a model that we can test and say, okay, let's say um, like um, last year for 10 days in February, uh, we had a cold snap with, with very little wind and very little solar. How, how can we cover that? 
Now, the answer may be hydrogen, but I, 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 I can't find the modeling work that tells me that hydrogen is the answer. What, what, I'm, what I'm finding is people telling me that hydrogen is the answer, but um, my nature is, okay, show me why hydrogen is the answer. Good. No, that definitely, that's, that's really, really good. I think diversity uh, means a lot when you're talking about energy as well. Uh, we, have, we have a couple of, of questions now popping up. Um, one from Dave Fisher. Um, he was saying that uh, he listened on uh, a podcast uh, about a, a hydrogen, I think, project. And uh, the case that they, 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 they clarify on that was when, sorry, oh, it just came up. So when, when the wind uh, uh, is high, the electric interconnector is overloaded. Therefore, instead of turning the turbines off, the wasted power is electrolyzed to hydrogen. Does, that, does this make sense to you or is it more spin? Not sure if you. Well, I, I, again, I, I, I don't know. Um, but what, what we could do, um, this is Michael, I think, asked that question. What we could do is we could, um, we could um, use that energy to charge batteries. Yeah. And I'm not saying batteries alone is the answer. We could use that surplus energy to heat up and store um, thermally. We could use that energy to compress gases, not necessarily hydrogen. And then when we need the energy back, we decompress the gas through a turbine. There's lots of other options for this surplus energy. But I don't know how much surplus energy we're going to have. And that's why I keep asking for a model. Let's see the model that shows how much statistically surplus energy we're going to have. And is that significant? And uh, turning it into hydrogen, with all the inefficiencies that hydrogen has got, will that materially supply uh, what we need uh, from energy security? So I, like Michael, I see lots of people talking about using surplus energy. I want to see the modeling and the numbers before I'll buy it. Definitely. Well, that, that's what the banks uh, want as well, want uh, before investing. So usually, at least for, for I guess. Uh, we have a, a hand up from uh, Kahe. So yeah, please open your mic and, and go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, Tom. Um, like, thank you very much for the uh, like inspiring presentation. Um, like, my question is that, um, Although, um, like, you showed us that like uh, hydrogen is a uh, very good energy um, for the future, but um, the data uh, like now is a bit disappointing. Are you expecting a more uh, like a combination of energy use um, in the future, like not only hydrogen but a like a combination of a few energy to suit each like consumer? I, 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 there is no one um, solution. What, what we need is, is um, we need a, a, a basket of solutions, yeah. And, uh, the, but what I don't know is the percentages of each one, yeah. I can see real advantages in electrifying passenger cars. I can see real advantages in electrifying households. And I can see real advantages in electrifying um, low temperature heating in industry. Yeah. But I, I'm only me. I, what, what this needs is the government to take ownership of all the options that we've got to, to, to model that and then pre prepare an evidence based case for yes, we need hydrogen and we need hydrogen to cover this. And the evidence is. It's showing us that. At the moment, and I'm repeating myself, I think the case is evidence weak. We need, we're engineers, we need evidence. We need numbers. And, and the debate for me is lacking numbers. And when, and when I do my own, my own numbers, I, I really start to question a lot of the hydrogen hype, if I could use that expression, that, that I read. And, and, and I get quite um, uh, concerned that they were pursuing 
um, uh, a route without proper analysis. I don't know if that answered your question, Carl, but that's... Um... Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have more a comment from, from uh, Michael Travis. Uh, yeah, saying that it was a great presentation and and uh, and what's really that we don't talk much about the demand side and uh, because it doesn't interest some parties because for the government, if there is more consumption, uh, they can put more tariffs, you have royalties, et cetera. And, uh, and for the big companies itself, it, it, it's also beneficial to sell more. But for the consumer side, if we have better habits, of course, trying to manage or have more, uh, more efficient uh, uh, equipment, et cetera, that would be beneficial. We could spend less, at least with, with the electricity. Um, and uh, well, let, let, let me just um, come in on that, Nathan. I, 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 when I'm asked, about greenhouse gas reduction, the first place I go to is energy efficiency. Yeah. yeah. Let's get after the demand side. Let's use less. And I, I've spent a lot of my career lecturing both industry and in academia about opportunities for energy saving. I, I, I think it's um, it, there's a huge opportunity there. But does that fit with big business? Big business will now sell less. Yeah, yeah, that's important. That's important. It's important to, to voice for these. Um, Alan, do you want to make your, your, your question by yourself? Uh, well, I can do, yes. Hello. Th thanks, Tom. Can you hear me? Am I yes, we can. Can, Alan. Yeah, great presentation. Lots of insights. Um, they're putting in the high net pipeline just close to me. Uh, I live in Chester, and I think that's going to be connected to the uh, to the blue hydrogen project in uh, next to Stanlow refinery. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, <laughs> should they be doing it? I wonder. Possibly not if they listen to your uh, arguments. I've I've um, I've moved off quite a bit about high net. And Acorn uh, and T side and Humber side yeah. blue hydrogen project, and, and I, I think they're flawed. I I I've, I think they need some due diligence done on the work um, to ensure that taxpayers' money, which is propping up these uh, this work, is being appropriately spent in the interests of the taxpayer. I have, I have grave concerns about high net and some of the other blue hydrogen uh, propositions. Okay, thank you. Uh, great presentation. I've got to go. But thank okay. you very much. Thanks, Alan. Okay, Nathan, uh, if we're drying up, um, maybe time to um, draw a line. Oh, sorry, I was, I was talking to mute. No, I would no. say if anyone has a, um, any last question, if not, um, yeah, 10 seconds, just five now. Yeah, so I would I would have like probably 10 uh, questions to you, Tom, about these. And uh, uh, I'm, as I said, uh, I'm a petroleum by background, currently work in Harbor Energy, but I'm really passionate outside of my job about energy and energy security and solutions that brings us to a, a brighter and a secure, a safer uh, 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 and a place in the future. So I think your questions, you, you are doing what I think we had expect to do and become engineers. That is really to question what is posed in front of us. So uh, in the name of, uh, or on behalf of the SP London YP and, and our attendees, I would like to thank you and, and ask you to continue uh, uh, pushing your, your, your way, ways to view things uh, that's really valuable, especially for us young engineers. Uh, there are some questions in the, in, the, in the chat now just about the presentation. Yeah, we'll uh, share a, a presentation to come from, from Tom. We ask you to follow Tom on LinkedIn uh, and where he really 
uh, kind of make public uh, his thoughts. So yeah, really thanks on behalf of the SP London section. Okay, th thanks, Nathan. I I'll just uh, is my slide still showing? Yes. So th there's my email address, and if anyone wants to um, ask me a question, or, or looking for some more information, I'm passionate about this, and I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about um, supporting young young engineers. So um, by all means, if someone wants to drop me an email with a question or or or, or a challenge, I'd be delighted to um, to respond to it. Yes. And then lastly, although um, in, in some uh, parts of um, the energy sphere, I am not a welcome voice. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that the, the, the brightest people we had in the world, they were inconvenient sometimes. So yeah, I think it, it's, it's part of our role. So yeah, really, thanks so much. Um, yeah, have a great evening, everyone, or morning, depending where you are in the world. And uh, yeah, please keep keep an eye on, on the SP London uh, uh, YP on LinkedIn. We will have more of these sessions. And if you have any suggestion, please uh, follow us and, and share your ideas with us. Thanks so much.